Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sohail Ali Show. And I am honestly at awe. It's an honor and a pleasure today because I'm joined by the legendary voice of the Indiana Hoosiers for the last 50 plus years, Mr. Don Fisher. Don, thank you so much for being here with me today. No, so hi, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to it. And uh, I must give a shout out to my father, Wade, from Wade's Tailoring, uh, hooking you up with some pieces there. And that, that's how we kind of <laughs> got to me. So absolutely. Uh, did you get a chance to catch uh, spring ball with Coach Signetti today? I did. I did. I've seen every practice they've had so far, and um, I'm impressed. I can tell you that right off the bat. Um, this guy knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, he has a formula. He it does. He adheres to that formula every day. He's in the office between 4 and 5 in the morning. Hmm. He's putting out practice uh, schedules for his coaches, um, and he runs a tight ship. And um, it's very impressive uh, just to watch him coach and to see how he handles things. Absolutely. Yeah, I heard you say you haven't been this excited for an IU season in a very, very long time. So that got me very excited. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i in. I got my recent alum season tickets. So let's <laughs> let's see some Hoosier football. Um, but, Don, again, I can't tell you how much of an honor it is to, to speak with you today. And I want to say uh, on behalf of Hoosier Nation uh, as a Bloomington native, uh, an IU alum and now staff member, uh, I want to say on behalf of Hoosier Nation, thank you so much for for your many decades of service and, and for being the voice of the Hoosiers for us. So thank you. Well, it's been my pleasure. Obviously, um, I, I've, I have been here a long time, just finished my 51st year, um, which is, it's just been, it, it feels like it's just flown by. Um, it's It's been a long time, but yet at the same time, it just feels like it was yesterday. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's the thing that when you, when you hear you, when you hear Don Fisher call games, the excitement, the passion, it's still there every game. And I wanted to ask you, Don, as on behalf of the fans, on behalf of, uh, you know, the generations of folks that have uh, heard you listen to you who have muted the TV and turned on the Don Fisher call, what goes through your mind when I say something like that, when, when someone he tells you that, you know, growing up, it was you in my house. You know, we said, let's watch the game, but let's hear Don on the call. What, what goes through your mind when you hear this? Something like that. Well, it's the ultimate compliment. It really is uh, to hear that people turn their televisions down and, and listen to the radio. And, and which, you know, in this day and age, it's kind of unusual that that still happens. But we know that it does. A lot of people come up and tell us that they still do that. Uh, with all the HD stuff on TV and that kind of thing, it has definitely been a problem to sync up the broadcasts because our timing is a little bit different and, and different radio stations have delays and things like that in their broadcast as well. So it, it's a, if you're going to do that, it takes a little work. And, uh, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm really excited that people still like to do that. There are some people that they say, well, we still listen. We don't, we don't change anything because the TV is way, uh, way behind your broadcast. So we just know what's going to happen before it does. <laughs> <laughs> so move it. It's kind of interesting to hear him. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to hear people talk about it. But it's it's a pleasure that uh, to me, it's 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 a great honor that people still would do that and still try to listen to ball games when they can watch them on television. Absolutely, and you know, one thing as I was researching you and watching countless interviews, one thing I wanted to know is, you know, we watch the players when they get ready for a game, but what's Don Fisher's pregame routine? How do you keep that voice so clear? Is there some kind of lozenges? There a secret tea involved? <laughs> well, there there are a couple of things that I do pretty consistently. Uh, I became a big fan of Hall's cough drops a long time ago. Um, and I, I was afraid that if I had one in my mouth while I was doing the broadcast, that it would affect how I did the play by play, but I learned very carefully how to take care of that, uh, and still be able to suck out a Hall's lozenge during a ball game. Uh, they've never sent me any free lozenges either. And I've always, ah. I've said this before, it's really upset me. <laughs> well, I was going to say, for God's sakes, Hall's, if anyone knows, let's, let's get it connected. Don Fisher sponsorship is right there. Are you kidding yep. me? I don't well, think they make the ice peppermint anymore, so I've got to find a different <laughs> different one of their lozenges. But uh, that's what I, I for years I've been ha uh, using Hall's cough drops because your your throat does get stressed a little bit during a broadcast, especially if it's a good game. <laughs> absolutely, 
Absolutely. Well, there we go. A little a peek inside the curtain there. And, and you know, other things that you do, you know, to prepare for a game, many people want to know, you know, how do you mem remember all the players' names and, you know, things like that that like goes into a game. Ha has your process stayed the same this entire time for preparing? Believe it or not, um, my process has never changed um, other than the technology of it because, mm. uh, you know, I didn't have a, a computer to work off of or anything like that up until about 2000, someplace in there. Everything that I did was by basically by hand, reading newspapers, reading uh, game notes and things like that, that we are furnished with at the college level, which is a tremendous help. Uh, the sports information department's uh, – uh, at every university are such an important and integral part for radio broadcasters. And and I've taken advantage of it for all the years that I've been at IU. Uh, Tom Miller was the first SID that I worked with. That mm. was back in 1973. Uh, and then Kit Klingelhofer, who was his assistant, took over after Tom retired. Uh, we've gone through a whole bunch of guys, and now we've got Jeff Keg and uh, Charlie Duffy and people like that that we're working with. And and they, they all these guys do a tremendous job. And they help us dramatically because there's a lot of preparation involved with it. You yeah. try as much reading material as you can on mm. the opposing team as well as your own. And so it's not a difficult process. It just takes time and it, and it requires work. There's a lot of preparation involved in getting ready for a broadcast. More so for football than basketball. The good news is mm. there's only one game a week in football. So you have <laughs> yes. all, all that week to lead up to it to, to get prepared where in basketball, you only have a couple of days, but here's the difference. You've got uh, maybe 50 to 60 players you've got to get ready for for a football game on both sides of the ball. And in basketball, you've only got 13 maximum. For the, there, there's walk-ons at other schools, but generally coaches only use about five to oh somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to ten guys in a ball game. Uh, rarely do you see much more than that unless it's a blowout one way or the other. Um, so you don't have as much preparation involved in basketball because it doesn't take as long because you're only working with so many people. And, you know, on that note, and, and you know, so many students, friends of mine, contemporaries of mine, they studied sports broadcasting. They studied sports journalism. In fact, they look up to the, the, the living legend you are. What, what do you tell students today uh, as far as advice for getting into this business and, and maybe sustaining a career as long as you have? Well, the truth of the matter is I never went to college. So when I go, when I talk to players or to students who are wanting to get into the broadcasting field, I, I can't give them as much information now as I used to be able to because radio has changed so much. And so many guys get into the business now to be television broadcasters because that's where the money's at. Um, in radio, uh, you're, you're going to have to go to work for a small town radio station or uh, a medium market radio station, you're not going to get the same kind of start that I did. I started out uh, at a radio station. Actually, I was working for the railroad when I got into this business. I was working as a ticket clerk uh, at a nighttime job, 9 to 6 o'clock in the morning. And when I decided to get into this business, I was looking at a sport magazine one night in the in the, uh, in the the depot where I worked. Uh, and on the back inside cover, it said, how would you like to be a sportscaster? And I went, Man, I think I could do that. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounded like the real. I maybe think better I, hours, I, maybe. <laughs> big, you know, I need a lot better hours than the nine to six in the morning <laughs> job that I had. So at any rate, uh, that's how I got involved in it. And I went to the local radio station in, in this town that I lived in, Mendota, Illinois. Uh, I went to that radio station. I went up to the program director who was the morning guy. His name was Art Mann. And I said, uh, would you mind if I came in here after my shift every every uh, day, Monday through Friday or whatever the case may be, and just watch what you guys do? And mm. he was more than willing to let me come. And I became their gopher. Uh, oh, my got them coffee when they needed coffee. I went and cleared the wire machines. Back in those days, they had AP and UPI, uh, United Press International, those wire services that gave you your news locally and statewide and, and nationally as well. So at any rate, uh, that, that was my first experience at a radio station. And I, while I was doing this home correspondence course in broadcasting, which was another, uh, I got about halfway through that and got my first radio job and never finished the, the program. <laughs> but, <laughs> but long story short, uh, the business has changed so much. Hmm. And today, if you are a person that wants to get into the broadcasting field, and this is a general comment, um, you have to go to college. 
uh, because that's where you're going to get experience. Because right. if you go to a broadcasting school like Syracuse, mm -hmm. they give you all kinds of opportunities. They teach mm -hmm. you all about the business, especially mm -hmm. from a television perspective, because if you go to a school that just has maybe a local radio station or a station that, that broadcasts student broadcast and things like right. that, uh, you're going to get maybe some experience, but it's not going to be enough. So a school like Syracuse, Indiana has a good broadcast school. It, they, there are so many schools now that yes. are providing you the information, telecommunications, and all those kinds of subjects that uh, teach you about this business. So it's different than when I got into it. And it was you know, even back in those days, a lot of guys were getting into this field. They had already had college experience so or mm. college degrees. So anyway, it is just so much different. But I will talk to anybody that comes up to me and asks me about this business because it's how I got started and it's where I have gained my, not fame, so to speak, but, but my career. It, my yeah. career has been in broadcasting and it's been in primarily radio although I did 23 seasons for the Indianapolis Colts doing their preseason games. So that was fun too. For people who may not be from Bloomington, for people who may have not be familiar with IU and the Hoosiers, could, how would you describe kind of Hoosier Nation and what we have going on here in Bloomington to someone who may not know? Well, I mean, Indiana to me has been such a special school. And I got into Indiana University where I started broadcasting IU games back in 1973, which was Coach Knight's third year and Lee Corso's first. Lee Corso was the football mm -hmm. coach they had just hired. And so I got to meet him early on and had an opportunity to, to uh, feel him out, see what kind of guy he was. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got the same opportunity with Coach Knight. And it wasn't as easy with Coach Knight as it was with Coach Corso. Corso was the most personable guy you could ever meet um, and always had a smile on his face, especially if he came up to a media guy. I mean, his guy was great with the media, where Coach Knight was a little bit lo less, I don't want to say he wasn't nice. Uh, he was a little more terse, I guess is the proper word. <laughs> he had his reservations. He did. He did. He he didn't trust the media very much and and probably some, with some justification perhaps. But at the same time, uh, they just had two different personalities. So I got an opportunity to work with two different guys immediately that told me, well, I can do this with this guy, but with this guy, got to be a little more careful or whatever the case may be. So I, it was great experience, and and I worked with Coach Knight for 27 of his 29 years at Indiana. Uh, Coach Corso was there for 10, so I got an uh, in indoctrination to both kinds of personalities. Hmm. And then, of course, I started doing interviews with the opposing coaches and things like that for our pregame shows and that kind of thing. That didn't yeah. happen until about 10 years in uh, mm -hmm. to the broadcast. But it, it's such an opportunity in those days to continue to learn – as you were doing your job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a sports director at WIRE in Indianapolis. That's how I got the position to be the play-by-play -play voice for IU. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's a long story about uh, how WIRE became the WIRE became the, the broadcast host or the network affiliate that was in charge of the network. And I did a lot of that work as well. But again, the broadcasting side of it was all about getting to know people, building relationships, um, and having an opportunity to do as much play by play as I could. And I, I let up, I, I was doing 175 games a year for two and a half years at Terre Haute. Uh, I had done so much play by play right. there and I was able to do anything I wanted to do in that regard because the radio station put everything play by play wise on their FM side. They were mm -hmm. a simulcast radio station, which means the programming on the AM and the FM were the same, except mm. it's sports. And the FM side would do all of the sports play-by-play because -play they had the nice. best signal. So nice. at any rate, long story short, um, my opportunities that built me in or got me the job in, in Indianapolis, a lot of it came from that Terre Haute operation. And and you mentioned, you know, uh, the late great Coach Knight, whom, you know, Hoosier Nation, we sadly lost last year. And, and you, right. for one, of course, got to spend many uh, a, a visit with, with Coach Knight with your show. You know, you were one of the, the few, you know, he led into that operation and, yeah. and gave us this is so many fans, uh, millions of fans, you know, every week, you know, that uh, that inside look into him. You know, uh, could you share maybe a, a moment or a favorite memory, a favorite uh, time you spent with with Coach Knight? Did you ever go fly fishing with the general? Did you ever? No. We, here's the funny thing. 
our relationship was uh, for about the first 10, 12 years that I was here, our relationship was just very much a business type thing. Hmm. Uh, and it became that because I was not here very much. I was in Indianapolis working my radio right. facility there. Uh, so I wasn't down watching a lot of practices. I did come down to practices. Incidentally, one of my proud moments uh, at Indiana University under Bob Knight was the fact that I got kicked out of practice three times. Three uh, times? <laughs> just just sitting, watching. I was the only guy in practice three different times. And he kicked me out three different times because he did not want me to see what he was going to about say and do with his players. <laughs> It was, in other words, those times were not the best. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's pre-smartphone too. He said, "I want no record of this." Period. Yeah, exactly. He, he kicked me out of practice, and so I left. And I, and, and I didn't. I never went. Like, really, you're you're kicking me out? No, I never said a word. I just got up and walked out. It's part <laughs> for the better. course with him. <laughs> exactly. But it was it was such it again he was such a he was a difficult guy to deal with sometimes and yet he could charm the socks off of anybody if you wanted to, he was an interesting man in that way and uh, and after about ten twelve years he finally warmed up a little bit and we finally had a relationship that I would call very professional but at the same time I'm he was inviting me to to go with the coaching staff when we were on the road at times to go out to eat, those kinds of things. So I got to share a lot of moments in that regard with the trainers and, and the assistant coaches. And and you got to know these guys, and you built that relationship. And I think yeah. we had a very good relationship as our – uh, as our relationship took pl took off through those years, that's wonderful to hear. And of course, everyone remembers, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when when Coach Knight made his return back to IU into Assembly Hall, and and so many of us watched that video, surrounded by his former players and right. and his son Pat and the coaches. You know, what was that environment like? What was it like being in Assembly Hall in such a moment? Well, it was emotional. I mean, you, you I looked around a few times while he was coming walking out, and. He looked. Uh, he just. He looked like he was so fragile compared to what he used to be, because he was kind of hunched over and those kinds of things. But the fact that he came back, that at one point he in the, after he got let go, uh, he said he'd never come back again. And the fact that he came back and he actually lived in Bloomington in his final years of life, um, you know, it was a very emotional day in that particular day that he came back and and came out on the floor and everybody greeted him and there was a standing ovation. I mean, there were tears flowing everywhere. Uh, people had, you know, they, they were all pining for him to be back in Bloomington mm -hmm. and, and the fact that he came back and then he lived there after that, I think it not only helped him because I think he was struggling at that time with the, some of the memory issues and those kinds of things, which, Many people go through these days, and I've had relatives that have done exactly the same thing, and it's such a tough thing, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and all these kinds of things that we can talk about at this point, but uh, it, it was so sad to see how a, the most brilliant mind I've ever been around, at least from a sports perspective, but Bob Knight, was he was reading War and Peace, and he was reading these Chinese war books, you know, that were that, that thick, you know? Mm. He, he was such an interesting guy in that regard, incredibly well-read. I believe he had a photographic memory. Mm. Um, and, and through all those years that he was such a great basketball coach, uh, and then to see him decline like he did at the end was very sad for all of us. But um, it was just great to have him back in Bloomington when he finally came back. Absolutely. I was actually recently watching, uh, I dug up, the I guess, the White House archives of uh, the 87 uh, championship team uh, with with President Reagan uh, out on the lawn there. And and it's like Knight, Coach Knight is such a figure. He's almost like dwarfing, you know, President Reagan out there. <laughs> and he's so charismatic. I mean, what, what, right. what do you think back to that time, 87, uh, the last title? Well, it was phenomenal. And that, that probably was the least talented of all Coach Knight's teams that won a national championship. The 76 team was phenomenal. As everyone remembers, they were unbeaten. About half that team went to the NBA, whether it was or the ABA for either a short or a lengthy time. Um, the '81 team, of course, had Isaiah Thomas and uh, Randy Whitman and Ted Kitchell and and that group, Ray Tolbert, uh, and and of course I, I, Isaiah was as charismatic a player as you've ever had at Indiana University, and one of the 
if you wanted to say who was the best player you ever saw at IU uh, from a standpoint of a Hoosier himself and, and not necessarily a Hoosier, but a player on the Indiana ball club, I would say that Isaiah Tal- uh, Thomas was the most talented player that Indiana ever had. Mm-hmm. But Coach Knight's great, great accomplishments were accomplished with players that weren't all the greatest players in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just had a talent for developing players, mm-hmm. And by the time they were seniors, which we don't see a lot of that anymore, if they're that good early, they're gone uh, to the NBA or whatever. But Today, he, surely. Yeah, and, and he had such a talent for developing players. Mm-hmm. And obviously a lot of people criticized some of the things he did as a coach and those kinds of things, but he was absolutely a genius when it came to coaching basketball. He simply, that's the only word that I can come up with to describe him as a basketball coach. And I still think to this day that he is the greatest college basketball coach I've ever seen. I'm talking college now. I'm not talking coaching of any kind, uh, anything else. I'm just talking about college basketball. And there may be people with more wins than he's had, but he has done it the right way every single year he was at Indiana in regard to never, uh, never even a thought about cheating or anything like that that was going on. Hmm. I just think, and, and, and watching him uh, break down film, mm. uh, watching him watch another team and figuring out exactly where their weaknesses were and how to exploit those weaknesses, those kinds of things. He was just a genius at mm. basketball. He really was. And he was often asked many times, would he ever go to the NBA? And he said, no way. And they said, well, why not? He says, those guys aren't going to listen to me. I know more about basketball than any of them, but he says, they're not going to listen to me. They make more money. They make more money than I would. He said, I'm never going to the NBA. So he had so many different things that he talked about in those kinds of, in, in those moments when, you know, when you could get him talking a little bit about these kinds of things and asking these kinds of questions. And he was so insightful about so many things. It was pretty impressive to say the least. What, what excites you about the upcoming uh, Indiana basketball team? And uh, should we have some hope moving forward? Oh, no question. There's always hope at Indiana. Um, it, it, you look at the games that the this team, this uh, last year's team played, and there were games you didn't think they had a prayer in. And mm-hmm. they act like the Kansas ball game. I think everybody early in the season felt like Indiana's going to get blown out by this Kansas ball club. And the next thing you know, this ball game's right there for Indiana to, to win if they, if they don't make mistakes at the end, which they often did uh, in crucial situations. But, but there is always hope at Indiana. And Indiana is always going to be a school that is given its due as far as basketball is concerned. The big question is, can you sustain it? Can you be mm-hmm. good year in, year out, year in, year out? And and that's the question right now that everybody's asking. And even though this team at the end of the season uh, was looking pretty bad, all of a sudden they won five games in a row. That's right. They kind of salvaged the rest of the year in many respects and got them out of that first day play in the big 10 tournament, which nobody wants to play in because you figure your chances of getting to the championship game are slim and none and slim may have just left town. So, (laughs) so (laughs) at any rate, but, but you know, and I think Mike Woodson, uh, I think he believes that he's going to get it done. And without question, they've got a lot of work to do in the portal this year. As everyone knows, when we're doing this, it's literally a week into the portal at this point, and a lot of guys have already gone by the wayside. But Indiana hasn't gotten those guys yet. But, of course, most of these guys aren't even dictating they're going to be in the portal or not from some of these schools that are still playing uh, until the last minute. And Mm -hmm. so you just wait to see who's available and then who you can get. And I know Mike Woodson and his staff are really working at it. When can we expect uh, Inside IU Basketball to be back with with you on, on the weekly show there? Yep, we'll have a Inside IU Basketball show next year. Uh, I can't. I don't have any dates yet because we don't even know what the schedule looks like at this point. But it'll start probably either late October, or the first of November. Uh, that's when we'll be doing our first shows of Inside IU Basketball. But we also have Inside IU Football. And we've got our new coach, Kurt Signetti, who will be a part of that. And he's already indicated we're going to be allowed to have a couple of players on on each of the shows this year, which is a little bit different than we've had for the last several years. And something I think it'll really make people excited about and obviously giving us a little bit more listenership. I think a lot of people are going to start listening to Kurt Signetti because I'm telling you, this guy is special. And, and I'm so excited about this football season upcoming. 
There are a lot of people that that don't really understand uh, Indiana football and how how difficult it has been to win at IU. This guy hasn't let that affect him in the least, and he believes he's going to win. He's got a system, and I've watched him in all these practices thus far here in the spring. And I can't tell you, I'm, I've not been this excited in a long, long time. For someone who's been doing your job as long as you have, and I'm sure you've had other opportunities and, you know, different spaces, but what's kept you coming back to, to IU year after year? You know, what's been, you know, the kind of things that made you proud to, to do what you do for so long? Well, I got into this business to be a sportscaster, and I got into it because I wanted to do play-by-play. And the most important thing to me about my career and about the business that I've been in all these years has been the play-by-play aspect of it. And I've had the chance to be a part of college athletics for 53 and a half years or 54, almost 54 years in total uh, because of the time I spent in Terre Haute with Indiana State and so on. But the 51 years I've spent at Indiana has just been so special to me because of the opportunity to do play-by-play And to do it at a program that even though football hasn't been as successful as basketball has been, uh, it's just, for for me, radio has been the opportunity to express myself about what I love about college athletics. And uh, it, you know, it's humbling to say the least that I've been able to survive this long uh, to do what I like to do and what I love to do. And that's why, that's why I keep doing it. I, I mean, the good Lord has given me good health and good genes. Uh, my parents are, my dad passed away when he was 87, but my mom is still alive at 97. God uh, bless her. <laughs> and so, and my grandparents both passed away on my mom's side, both passed away at 91 and 98. So, uh, I got good genes in the, in the background. And that tells me that maybe I can keep doing this for a few more years yet. <laughs> What's your mom's secret? How many halls does she have? How, what? <laughs> I don't think Halls I don't think Halls really did it for her. <laughs> Don, I mean just it's an honor, a privilege really and uh, as someone like I said who's known your voice his entire life, I can't tell you what it means uh to get to know you and and, and speak with you today. Finally, uh just wanted to ask you, you know, doing your job, you know, clearly you love it and I don't think you're stopping anytime soon. It sounds like uh what continues to motivate and inspire you today? Uh, I, to be honest with you, I just, I want to win another national championship, (laughs) whether it's in football or basketball, I don't care which, I just like to be a part of that again, just to be, it's, it's so much fun to be a part of success, as you know. And, um, you know, the first 25, 30 years I was here, we didn't have anything but success. Um, and, and obviously the Bill Mallory era was the, since I've been at Indiana, that's the, the best football era we've had. Uh, I thought it was going to be special when Terry Hepner was with us. Uh, he, he became, he and I became really close friends in the very short time that I knew him. Uh, I got, I met him up in Fort Wayne at the Matt Anthony's mm. uh, golf outing, uh, one year. And, uh, he knew more about IU than I did at the time. It was unbelievable because we were in a car riding back to the hotel after a practice round that we played up there. And he was such an interesting guy and what a personality he had. I always called him the Pied Piper because I thought this guy can, <laughs> he could charm the socks off of anybody and he would have people following him because I thought he would have been able to recruit anybody that he went after. And there were a lot of players that were willing to come to Indiana, but he got sick uh, in the very first year, right after the first season that he was broadcast or was a uh, part of Indiana football. Mm. And then the next year, he had two surgeries during the season uh, or a surgery during the season. And then, of course, he passed away the next June. Uh, uh, from the brain tumor. So, uh, it was so disappointing, but cause I thought that guy was going to get it done. And yeah. I kind of feel the same way about Kurt Signetti. I think that guy is going to get it done at Indiana. That's why I'm so excited right now. Absolutely. Well, your excitement, I mean, it should, it should also excite all of us who will be watching and listening, uh, to the one and only Don Fisher for the upcoming year. And Don, I hope you enjoy your, your time away. I hope you can relax a bit, uh, uh, enjoy the halls and, uh, we'll definitely enjoy you when you're back in the hall, uh, this upcoming uh, year. And again, I can't tell you how much it's meant to me on behalf of who's your nation. Thank you again for all the amazing work you've done and continue to do. Well, it's very nice of you to say so, Ohio. I enjoyed it immensely. It was a good time.
Thanks for having me. Real quick before you click away, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, comment below, and subscribe for all future videos. And be sure to check out these two videos right here. Hope you have a great one.